Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Ovarian Reserve Assessment. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few quick items about today's event. First, all physicians in attendance today will receive an AMA PRA Category 1 credit, and all other providers will receive a certificate of completion for one contact hour credit. The certificate will be emailed to you by Harvard around midsummer. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Gary Frischman practices at Boston IVF's Providence, Rhode Island location, and he is double board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Dr. Frischman received his undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and his medical degree from Columbia University, followed by a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. He completed his reproductive endocrinology and infertility fellowship at the University of Connecticut. He is a clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Warren Al Alpert Medical School of, of Brown University. Dr. Frischman takes great pride in his teaching, his teaching for patients, medical students for tra and trainees, and practicing physicians and has received teaching awards from Brown University and the national organizations of ACOG, CREOG, and APCO. He specializes in all aspects of the infertility care and prides himself in providing compassionate, empath empathetic, and outstanding care to all. We encourage you to submit questions to Dr. Gary Frischman using the question section of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the questions and answer session at the end of today's presentation. All right, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Frischman. Welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to uh, be able to give this talk. Um, ovarian reserve testing, the biologic clock is something that we do, but for a long time, I really didn't understand it as much as I might have and, and trying to explain what we do and why we do, which I just think it makes it more fun to practice. Um, I have no disclosures for this talk. So what I'd like to go through is the aging process, sort of to explain why the labs change and to also explain why we get the labs. Um, and then sort of go over the normal values. I'm going to, the caveat is, is that the different labs and the different assays differ, but to give you an understanding. Um, and then uh, sort of a tricky but very important concept is quantity versus quality, which we'll talk about more in a second. So I think we all grew up looking at FSH, um, very well established. And throughout this talk, the green lines are the estradiols and the red lines are the FSH. And, and we see in the um, down here, the day three. Uh, so the day three FSH is what we all grew up with. We all measured day three FSH. Um, and we all knew that as a woman gets older, she has fewer recruitable follicles. We know at 20 weeks gestation, it's about eight, uh, 20 million, um, sorry, 7 million at, at birth, it's about 2 million. At puberty, it's about 400,000. And so there's this inevitable decline, whether a woman is pregnant before puberty on the birth control pill, and that these recruitable follicles go down. And with that, the inhibin level, which is suppressive, goes down. And then this leads to that increase of FSH that we're all familiar with. So in the same woman, as she gets older, on any one cycle, her day three FSH is likely gonna be elevated compared to previously. And importantly, the numbers, this is all freehand drawn, but it's just to give you the sense. So I think what we all knew from medical school and moving forward is as a woman gets older, her A3 FSH increases. Now, what's really kind of interesting is what happens as a result of that. So as the FSH increases, we, it reflects the diminished pool of follicles. But no one told those follicles that are left, hey, you should behave differently because you're older and there's less FSH on board. All they know is they are programmed to respond to a certain FSH level. And so if they see a higher level of FSH earlier than they normally would, then the, they will respond in an accelerated manner. And as such, the follicular phase will shorten. So what does that look like graphically? And again, just freehand drawn. 
So we see FSH is rising. And let's just say that um, let's just say that this is the level of FSH you need to respond. And since um, since you're seeing it earlier as the FSH shifts, the eggs are going to be recruited in an accelerated fashion. And as the eggs are recruited in an accelerated fashion, the estradiol curve is going to rise also. And that's why we look at day three estradiol, because as there is accelerated follicular recruitment, the follicles that are able to respond that didn't listen to the message, hey, there's higher FSH, but we still want you to be recruited at the same speed, they get recruited quicker in an accelerated fashion. And as a result, the early cycle day three FSH rises. So what are some of the implications of this? Well, first of all, spontaneous twinning. I, through residency my early career, I never understood why maternal age was a risk factor for twins. But now it makes perfect sense. As a woman gets older, her FSH rises. The follicles that are there, not many left maybe, but they're the ones that are respond to FSH. And it's kind of like they're taking a little bit of clomiphene, clomid. They have seen more FSH and you're more likely to have twins. Um, one of my colleagues uh, had three boys, wanted a girl, he and his wife were struggling. What do you do? Do we adopt internationally? What do we do? Um, they got pregnant spontaneously, twin boys. So, um, but she was a little older, and so higher risk of twins as maternal age is a risk factor. All of a sudden it clicks, totally makes sense. What's the other profound implication of this? As you have accelerated recruitment and the follicular phase shortened, the entire menstrual cycle shortened. So if we look here, a woman whose cycles used to be 28 days may now be 26 days. And counterintuitively, one of the first things that happens as a woman approaches menopause is that her cycle length shortens. Because I think of menopause and you know, advanced, advanced reproductive age as you have your regular cycles or lengthening cycles. But in reality, the cycle shortens. And as such, if a woman comes to my office, essentially regardless of age, and she says, I have regular cycles 26 days, I'll say, what were they five years ago, 10 years ago, not on the birth control pill? And if she said, oh, they've always been 26 days, terrific. But if she says, oh, you know, five years ago, they were 28 days, they're still regular, but now they're 26 days, that's very concerning because it fits with everything that we've talked about. It fits that this decreased number of eggs, increased FSH, accelerated recruitment, with accelerated recruitment, an elevated day three estradiol, and with accelerated recruitment and a shortened complete cycle length. So very important if there's a you know less than a 28 day or even with 28, what have your cycles been off of the birth control pill? But if we have these other parameters, cycle length and FSH, why do we test estradiol? What's the value of testing estradiol? And it increases sensitivity. And I always get confused. What's sensitivity and specificity? And sensitivity is the chance of finding something if it's there. Whereas specificity is the accuracy of the finding. If you have that test being positive, how accurate is the results? And as a rule of thumb, the tests that we do aren't very sensitive, meaning a number of women that have diminished ovarian reserve will have normal tests, but they're pretty specific, meaning if a woman has an abnormal test, it's likely true as opposed to a false positive. So by ordering extra tests, we're more likely to find an abnormal value in someone who has diminished ovarian reserve. So the extra test increases the sensitivity and increases the chance of a finding. The other big piece is we all know that estrogen suppresses FSH. And if you have that accelerated recruitment and your estrogen is high early in the cycle, that may suppress your FSH. So if you only measured FSH, you'd have a normal value. So here's a real patient. 
she had a pretty markedly elevated estradiol. This is unusually high, not cancer high, but the FSH is completely normal. And if I had gotten just the FSH, I would have been completely reassured because my test was not very sensitive. And when and, and in my lab, the AMH comes back later. So I got these results and I'm like, huh? And then the AMH came back menopause, less than 0.1, undetectable. So if we had only done the tried and true FSH, which we all grew up with, that was the only test that I used to get historically, we would have missed by several measures. So by measuring the estradiol, we both increase the sensitivity of our testing algorithm, we increase the chance of finding something, and then we may have a falsely normal FSH because the estradiol suppresses it. So it's easy, you get it all at the same time. Another big change became what day to get tests. I grew up, it had to be day three. Now, one of the ironies of day three is, what's the first day of the period? Is it spotting? Is it flow? Is it full day flow? And there is no one answer, so it's dealer's choice. We, we typically say that it's the first full day of flow, and you get your period at 10 p.m., that's not cycle day one. But it's important to know that as with most things in medicine, there's no proven reason, but the key is, is that you want a, a full flow that spotting doesn't count. So, but which day does it have to be day three? So this was a study by Hansen way back in 96. The senior author was Steve Corson, who, who was my mentor in residency, uh, still good friends. And what he did, very simple, he had his own RAI lab, he had his own endocrine lab, and he just had women volunteer and he drew their bloods days two, three, four, and five in the same cycle. And then he just compared, were the results comparable across those days? If the results were comparable, then you could extend it past day three. And what he found kind of makes sense if you know the curve. And again, this is all freehand draw. But we know the FSH doesn't super change a lot during the cycle in the beginning part. Whereas we know there's that estradiol surge, because we, we learn in med school that the estradiol surge is what leads to the LH surge. And so it makes sense that the estradiol surge will potentially have very different values on different days. So what he found was days two through five doesn't really matter FSH. And if all you're going to do is measure FSH, you can do it any of those days. But estradiol, because of that surge, days two and three were close enough, but day four was not. But this was huge, because if you asked me before the study came out, it had to be day three. The results were not valid. But now with estradiol, we can get it on day or two or three, and that's really the mantra. That to me is standard of care, day two or three. But if we get it day four, FSH is okay, but not as but not estradiol. So our litany, what we do routinely is day two or three. Day one is the first full day of flow, kind of whatever that means, but first day of flow. A woman says, I flow, stop, spot, stop, flow, start. I'm like, don't know. For those patients, you can get serial progesterones, which is no fun for anyone to see when when they, uh, they're they no longer in the luteal phase. But regardless, first full day of flow. Now, I want to come back and talk a little bit about this sensitivity specificity thing, just in case you weren't confused enough. Um, so to go back to what I said, sensitivity, these tests are not very sensitive, but they're pretty specific. A bad value is bad. So if the value is good, it's reassuring, but not overly helpful. So if I have someone who's 42 and they have great values, well, I'll say you'll probably make a bunch of eggs, but I don't know really how much to interpret it. But if a value is bad, it's concerning, we generally don't want to repeat it. Because if it's bad on one cycle and the next cycle it's good, you it doesn't change how I manage that patient. It doesn't change how I counsel that patient. It just makes things more confusing. And it makes it more likely that she will be understandably confused and will be questioning what things are done and questioning your counseling. And we all know one of the most challenging parts about counseling women with diminished ovarian reserve is helping them to understand that concept and letting them know what the limits are. And for some women, it's try, try, try. But for other women, it's let's move on to the next step, whatever that may be. Um, and if their results are intermittent, uh, then it is um, then it's challenging. There's there's a great concept called 
intermittent positive reinforcement, which is what the Las Vegas casinos do. And basically, you go in with 100 bucks, that's what you're going to lose, and then you have 10 bucks left and you win 30. And you keep going. And the next thing you know, you've lost $1,000. And so I think it's very important with sheer decision making and patient autonomy to let a patient do what she's right, but you want to get the data as clean as possible. So what do we have for data for this? So this is an older study, but it's really neat. So it was done with a ton of IVF cycles, and then they looked back, so retrospective, so that's a limitation. They looked back and they said, let's look at the same cycles of women and see that they had variations in their testing. Now, this was like over, this is 25 years ago, so a pregnancy rate of 16% wasn't so bad. But if they looked at the large bulk of the patients, so again, limitations in the study, not a large N in the others, but if you always had a good FSH, back then an assay of less than 20, so always good FSH, it kind of didn't matter what cycle it was, you rolled the dice, you had a good pregnancy rate at that era. But if your FSH was always greater than 20, essentially no chance of getting pregnant. So that makes sense. If every cycle you go through, and that cycle had its FSH tested for that cycle, and it was always elevated, you didn't have a good chance of getting pregnant. But the beauty of this study, what makes it so interesting and so valuable, is what about the cycle, woman in which some cycles were elevated and some cycles were normal? So if you had an elevated FSH in just one cycle, your pregnancy rate is terrible, a third of what it would be in the woman who always had a good FSH. And gosh forbid you had an FSH elevated in more than one cycle, you didn't get pregnant. You behaved as the same woman whose FSH was elevated every cycle. And so this all follows with what I've been saying. These tests are very accurate if they're off. They're very specific, but they're not very sensitive. So you don't want to repeat them. And for better or for worse, you act on the test that's the most concerning because that's likely reflective. I'm, I'm kind of infamous for kind of silly analogies, and I, you know, if patients have had a bunch of tests that have been, you know, one has been off, I say it's kind of like you drive your car to the store three times, and it only breaks down once. You don't say, well, it didn't break down the other two times, I'm good to go cross country. We have to go with the most concerning value. I'd like to touch now on the concept of quantity versus quality, and this is tricky as well. So the sneak preview, the spoiler alert, is your FSH, your biologic clock tests, reflect quantity of eggs. Your age, this irreversible changes in age, reflect quality. And the way I remember this in my mind's eye is you never recommend an amniocentesis based on FSH. I mean, now everyone gets it, but you recommend amniocentesis historically based on age because it's the age of the egg that reflects the risk of things like Downs. You put a 20-year-old egg in a 40-year-old, the risk of Downs is the same as a 20-year-old. So age is the quality. You can't overcome that. FSH biologic clock testing is the quantity. And one of the huge advantages in our field is pre-implantation genetic testing, where we can test the embryos because we would have women that were in their early 40s with very low FSHs, and they would get 20 eggs. They would get more eggs than a younger woman. And they would just keep putting back embryos and have miscarriages or not being pregnant. Um, but it was difficult to counsel them that, yes, you may be getting lots of eggs, but because that reflects quantity, not quality, the quality is based on your age, it's still a bad egg. And now with PGT, you test all the embryos, and if they have a great embryo, you put that one back without doing transfer, 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 transfer. Um, and so, but if they have all abnormal embryos, that's very powerful. So let me give you a um, let me give you a some studies that look at this, um, and I'm going to try to make sure that we get done with plenty of time for questions. Ironically, Mike Albert, I got this slide from him. I don't know, 15 years ago, well before I joined Boston IVF. So these are three slides looking at studies that looked at FSH and H. And this first one looks just at FSH. And no surprise, as FSH rises, cancellation rates go up, 
and cumulative live birth rate, meaning the chance of going home with the baby, goes down. So this is kind of a no-brainer. As FSH rises, we would all say this. In med school, you could say this. As FSH rises, you have a lower chance of getting pregnant and staying pregnant. But better to be young with an elevated FSH than old with a normal FSH. And the study was the all day three FSHs, but it's the same. So this study broke women down between under 38 and 38 or older, and then they marched up the FSH. So if you're young, with best to be young with a low FSH, but even if you're young with a high FSH, the implication is you don't have as many eggs, but those eggs are still good quality because those eggs reflect your age. So quantity is less shown by the FSH. Quality is still, is still good based on your age. So if you're 38 and you have a low FSH, your pregnancy rate, 12%, is still less than that younger woman with a high FSH. But gosh forbid, you're over 38 with a high FSH, then no chance of pregnancy. So better to be young with a high FSH with fewer but good quality eggs than older with a low FSH. You may have lots of eggs, but they're of less quality. I love this study, although I passed 41 20 years ago. Um, so they called 41 in FSH. And so if we look here, um, if you're young with an elevated FSH, still an ongoing pregnancy rate per embryo transfer, and a, and a you know, but if you're old, low pregnancy rate. So again, better to be young with an elevated day three FSH than old with a normal FSH. And although I don't think these studies have been done with other markers such as AMH, which we'll talk about in a second, the data still pretty much holds true. So age is quality. I remember that because amniocentesis is done based on age, not FSH. And FSH is quantity, which again makes sense because we know that day three reflects the number of eggs and such. So the next thing that came up was the antral follicle count. And the antral follicle count has been based on ongoing IVF pregnancies and is actually a pretty sweet test. It's just a transvaginal ultrasound done days two to three, and you measure the number of small antral follicles, um, and that gives you a sense of the biologic clock. The analogy that I offer to my patients is it's kind of like a pipe and the eggs are coming out one end of the pipe. If you wanna see what's gonna be coming downstream, you look at the beginning of the pipe and we're looking at the early eggs. And the studies vary as with all of these things, but basically four to six is okay. We like to see more and 15 may be more consistent with PCOS. And for those who haven't seen it, so basically you just look at an ovary. And if we look at the ovary up in the upper left, if this is just a slice, we see like one follicle. And you know, when I teach residents this and I say, you know, when you're in the emergency room scanning or someone comes in with a GYN complete scanning, it's like seeing a landmark on the highway that you never noticed, but once someone points it out, you never miss it. And so once when you're scanning non-pregnant women, not on the birth control pill, you'll notice that the younger women, if they, you know, if they have a little bit of cramping, you're looking for a ruptured cyst or something, and you notice that their ovaries have lots of follicles. And you have that perimenopausal woman who's coming in with dysfunctional bleeding, postmenopausal spotting, and you scan her and her ovaries may be hard to find. So we see that, you know, follicle here, follicles here, but it's a pretty straightforward test. All you do is you sort of count them. And I don't, I'm circling this for the slide, but I don't even count them. I don't even circle them on it. You just go through, scan one, both, both ovaries if they have them. If it's only one, you do one, it's valid. And then you do it, and that's the antral follicle count. And if they've got a ton of follicles, then that's PCOS. And this is the classic string of pearls around the periphery and a very high AMH, which we're going to talk about in a second. So antral follicle count is a very important study, super easy to do. You grab it days two or three in your office. It's a legitimate transvaginal ultrasound. We use it also, like if I'm going to start someone on a, on a stimulation cycle and all of a sudden their antral follicle count's really high, I may lower their dose. But this is one of the best markers we have. It's a legitimate study that you do in your office and very powerful. The other one, 
the ACE of the studies is AMH, anti-malarian hormone. And I can talk about inhibin B later if people wish, but this has replaced it. So AMH, also known as malarian inhibiting substance, is the holy grail because we can get it any cycle day. And these are some of the values, and I'm gonna, Dan, I'll repeat all the normal values, but it's important to know that the assay really varies and most assays will say what they mean. But the key about AMH is it may be the single best marker. So if someone has financial limitations, their self-pay, or for whatever reason, you can only get one test, AMH would be it. And most people, this is controversial, but most people that do what I do would agree with that. It's also fabulous because it's cycle day independent. FSH is the good days two, two through five, estradiol two through three. You get those at other cycle days and they don't, we can't interpret them. We cannot interpret them from the perspective of the biologic clock. Um, but having said that, we typically get this with everything else for the reasons that I said earlier. The more tests, the more likely that we are to get it. Why is FSH the single best test? Why has it essentially replaced FSH? Um, why is AMH the best test? Uh, understanding that we still get both. So if we look here, this is kind of a slide that shows the different stages. All you need to do, no test, is the different stages of development from the initial recruitment, uh, cycle recruitment, selection, dominance. So we know that the eggs, in med school I was taught each cycle is you know, one month, that's when the egg starts getting recruited. We actually know that the eggs are starting to get recruited the cycle before. So AMH and FSH are recruited, but But FSH is just this one section, whereas AMH is the whole thing. FSH is just the cycle where they're really going through, whereas AMH is the whole continuum. And it makes sense that you wanna measure the whole continuum because that's gonna be more reflective. And that may be why also that AMH is not cycle dependent because it's testing the entire ovarian reserve, kind of not just maybe the cohort that's going through. So for a bunch of reasons, AMH is great. It's the best, most accurate single study. We can get it any cycle day. But as I said earlier, we tend to get everything because it's more sensitive and stuff. Now, which test should I order in my practice? That's really, just tell me what to do. That's what I tell people. So it's a little bit tricky because I've emphasized, hopefully, the importance of age. One of the things that really is overlooked is the duration of infertility as it impacts on a woman's chance of getting pregnant. And it's just stunning the numbers. So if a 30 year old comes to my office and she says, I'm just got married, going off the pill, next month I'm gonna start trying, what's my chance of getting pregnant any one month? 20%, something like that. Another 30 year old comes to my office, everything exactly the same, risk factors, history. The only difference is she went off the pill three years ago and she's been trying, her chance of getting pregnant any one month is 2%. So after three years of trying, you drop to 2%, which at first point is stunning, like how can that be true? But when you think about it, anyone who could have gotten pregnant has pretty much gotten pregnant. Importantly, that number is not zero. I always say two is low, but it's not zero, and you could get pregnant during the evaluation or the treatment. But the reason this is important for our discussion today is age is super important, but duration of infertility is also important. And so if a woman's been trying for a long time, even if she's young, I'm gonna cast a wider net in my evaluation in general because I'm more concerned about diminished ovarian reserve. So, but if that woman is young and she's got a short duration of infertility, I would probably just get an AMH. Certainly if they were self-pay, I would get just an AMH. We tend to get more. Um, subspecialists tend to order more for better or for worse. We want to be thorough um, and you all are referring providers often get tests to start out with so we want to flesh it out. But if they're older or a long duration of infertility, I get everything. I get the imaging and I get the antrophological count. And hopefully that makes sense because the more concerned you are, the wider the net you, ca you cast, even though it costs more. Now, in terms of the values, the big caveat for all of this is it's really gonna be the lab. For the FSH, the thing I want you to take home though is a younger woman should have a lower FSH. So if I have a 38 year old in my office and her FSH is nine, okay, I don't really think much of that. That's you know consistent with her age. It's not concerning, it's not overly reassuring, it's okay. 
But if I have a 28 year old in my office, and her FSH is nine, and you look on your algorithm and you look on your assay, it's likely gonna be, that's the normal range, that is concerning. Not scary, terrifying, not she's gonna go through menopause tomorrow, but concerning. Estradiol varies based on every test, every study that you read, but low is good, higher is bad. And AMH, very much cycle dependent. Um, very high, AMHs are PCOS, and there's increasing literature to suggest that high AMH actually has its own issues with getting pregnant, with concerns, um, and that low AMH, that 0 0.3, 0 0.4, the patient I showed earlier, the less than 0.1, the undetectable, those are really concerning because, again, AMH is kind of the gold standard. And then the antral follicle count, again, remember, we're getting this cycle day two or three. We wanted more than four to six. We're measuring those small follicles, both ovaries. They can't be on the pill. If it's a big follicular cyst, that's going to suppress it. But um, but but so so but antrophocal count is great. So sort of just to summarize the key things, we know that as a woman gets older, her number of eggs declines commensurate with her fertility. But as the eggs decline, FSH rises, and that's that day three FSH. As day three FSH rises the eggs that are still around undergo accelerated follicular recruitment because no one's told them, hey, behave the way as if the FSH wasn't elevated. And as that FSH is elevated and there's accelerated follicular recruitment, estradiol rises, and the chance of more than one egg being released rises, so maternal age twins. And as there's accelerated follicular recruitment, the whole cycle shortens. So a woman who's always had 28-day cycles now is 26-day cycles. Our test that we get, if I wanted to get just one test for me, it would be AMH. If I was getting more of a panel, it would be FSH, estradiol, and AMH, and I would get them cycle day two or day three, but not four, five, six, seven. Um, and day one would be when your first full day of flow is. And then if I had the infrastructure in my office, I'd just grab an natural follicle count. We're thrilled to get it for you. I would not repeat the tests if they're no abnormal because it's very specific but not sensitive. You drive your car to the store once it breaks down, you don't say, I'll drive again and then I'll go cross country. Um, and we get as many values as we can. So I wanted to do this in 30 minutes. I went to 31 minutes um, to make sure there's lots of time for questions. I'll bring it back to Alyssa and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. I hope this was informative. Thank you, Dr. Frischman. We are now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions to the, the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Dr. Frischman, our first question is, are there additional tests you do on everyone, like thyroid levels, and if so, what are they? Great question. Um, so uh, this test was about ovarian reserve. This, this was about ovarian reserve, uh, not thyroid. So we get, so thyroid is a little bit controversial because it's not a common cause from a cost of effective way, but it's dirt cheap. So I get a TSH, I think me and my peers get TSH. I mean, you walk through our door, we grab a TSH. The controversial part about a TSH is the gray zone of, of um, subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, and then do you care whether they have antibodies and stuff? So, but the short version is I do get a TSH in everyone. Prolactin, some people get it in everyone. I get it just on people with irregular cycles or symptoms um, because of just the yield and trying to be cost effective. Those are pretty much the fertility tests. In our world, REIs typically get um, STI panels because we need it for FDA, so HIV, AIDS, uh, hepatitis, et cetera. Uh, we, I check everybody before they get pregnant for chickenpox and rubella, uh, varicella and, and rubella. Um, because if they're not immune, this is the easy time to vaccinate them. So REIs are a little different that way. We just, you, we're drawing your blood, let's get it. Um, and, and if you're not immune, we vaccinate. And then you wait the month and it's just much better. You've all had patients that are not immune to rebel during pregnancy and then you're terrified the whole pregnancy. Likewise, we get genetic screening ahead of time. We offer it. Um, and, and that way, if they're carriers for cystic fibrosis and things like that, um, blood type and stuff. So that's sort of the blood panel that we get. But for ovarian reserve, I've mentioned everything. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, how long do you typically wait to run these tests after a person stops hormonal con contraception 
Does it vary by contraception method? Great question. So the older version of that, literally and figuratively, is that woman that's perimenopausal, when do you check the FSH? And I grew up being taught that you do the last pill-free day because if they're on OCPs, it can suppress. There is no unaccepted data, but I think if uh, if they're willing to wait one full cycle, that's great. Um, if if you're in a rush and you're not concerned and you're willing to give up a little bit of that specificity sensitivity, meaning you're not exactly as sure it's going to be, you know, you have them go off of it. But part of it is how long they've been on OCPs, right? If they've been on OCPs for 10 years, I really want them to have a cycle, their cycle on their own. If they've been on it for a few months, if they're on very low dose hormonal contraception as opposed to a bigger gun, you know, Depo-Provera, we know that that can wait a long time. So, so without data, so I, I try to be very clear what is science and what is voodoo, but the, the stronger the hormonal contraception, the longer I might wait, but really never more than one normal menstrual cycle. Um, and if it's just a touch of hormonal contraceptive for not that long, then I would probably grab it when they go off the meds. Thank you. The next question is, PCOS patients have lots of follicles. What does this mean for egg retrieval and quality for achieving pregnancy and live birth? I apologize, who has lots of follicles? PCOS patients. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, P I have uh, silly analogies. I, I tell my woman with PCOS that their ovaries are like a Ferrari race car engine. And we step on the gas a little bit, so nothing happens, a little bit more, nothing happens, and then they're going 100 miles an hour over the cliff. And it's our job as REIs to make sure they don't go over the cliff, but we get lots of eggs. I also touched on earlier that AMH, increasing data, related to or independent of PCOS may have its own issues. But the key take home with PCOS is, is that they are very sensitive to stimulation. And in the era where we used to do Clomid, then gonadotropins, pergonol, then IVF, it was terrifying because it was like that Ferrari race car engine. And these women would really over-respond and they'd really be at risk of multiples if we were putting the sperm in, you know, either IUI, intrauterine insemination, our intercourse. Now with IVF, we're all good. And the single most likely big time issue with IVF is the ovarian hyperstimulation, where they over-respond. The Ferrari race car engine kicks in, the rest of dial shoots up. Um, and, 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 and that was terrifying historically. And you might have to cancel the cycle. Um, to put this in perspective, an estrogen on a normal cycle might be 250 picograms per ml. Historically with IVF, 1,000, 2,000, maybe 3,000. Above that, I get antsy. Now we can do something called a freeze-all cycle. And a freeze-all cycle is where we take out all the eggs, as many as we can get, always, but then we don't do a transfer. We freeze all the embryos. And we do that routinely when we do genetic testing on the embryos because we've got to send it out and they've got to come back. But if we do that in a woman who's an over-responder or what we call hyper-responder, such as PCOS, their estrogens are in the four, five, six, seven thousand. I mean, just incredible. And they do okay because they the single biggest issue is the hyperstimulation. So the short answer to your question is with PCOS, they tend to get more eggs. If they're younger, the eggs tend to be of good quality. And we either would do the fresh transfer if it's safe, but if they are at risk for hyperstimulation, we freeze all. And I tell these women, you'll never have to go through another fresh IVF cycle again, hopefully, because you'll have embryos and we just keep putting them back and we put them back on a cycle without stimulation. So there's no risk of hyperstimulation. And I joke, I will put back as many embryos as you want, but only one at a time. So we put back that one at a time and the risks of the uh, multiples goes away as well for the vast majority other than splitting. So it's a great question and it's one of the big advances in treating PCOS. This question still has to relate to PCOS. Um, it is, if a patient has PCOS but does ovulate, does the quality of eggs differ? So PCOS is a really debated, so we all know the Rotterdam criteria, um, irregular or absent cycles, hirsutism, and those PCOS ovaries with the high antral follicle count. And one of the big debates is really should we have PCOS women that are hirsute and lots of eggs, extra androgens and lots of eggs, but with regular cycles? 
because often the younger woman is, you know, you take an 18 year old and she's going to have PCOS ovaries all the time because she has lots of eggs. So if a woman has a regular cycle, she can be PCOS, but typically, um, you know, we, most PCOS women don't. But that, I think the core question is, is an egg from a PCOS woman meaningfully different than an egg from a woman with regular cycles who's not PCOS, age matched, right? I'd rather a PCOS egg from a 30 year old than a healthy egg, if there's such a thing from a 40 year old. There may be some difference, but, but if we're typically getting lots of eggs and for IVF, it becomes much less important. And the risk of miscarriage for someone who ovulates with, um, someone who ovulates on clomiphene or letrozole is not meaningfully different. The risk of birth defects is not meaningfully different. And if we're lucky to be able to lose weight and that PCOS woman resumes ovulation on her own, the effects sort of reverse. Now, having said that, are there other issues with PCOS that can meaningfully impact on the health of a pregnancy, such as the obesity itself, such as the higher insulin levels, such as the higher angina levels? Absolutely. So PCOS women may have fraught pregnancies for a host of reasons. But in my mind, my personal opinion is the egg itself is not a huge contributor to that. Thank you. The next question is, women with extra long periods, usually around 40 days, confirmed not to be PCOS. Does that indicate slowdown of biological clock of egg quality? So what is the impact of someone who's outside the typical parameters? So if it's, it's unusual to have very long cycles that are irregular, meaning like mo most women in my experience, I have cycles that are 40 days, 30 days, they're oligoovulatory. Some cycles are longer. Every once in a while, it's six months. That to me is much, much more common than the woman who says, I have regular cycles, but they're 40 days start to start. Um, those are uncommon enough that there's not really any meaningful literature. Um, Irregular cycles in a younger woman is typically not due to ovarian aging issues. It's typically due to some variation of the hormonal imbalance, prolactin, TSH, something that we don't know about. You know, what is the exact cause of, of PCOS? That would be a whole lecture in itself. Um, so, so irregular cycles in a younger woman is less likely to be reflective of ovarian age, although it certainly could be, which is why we test ovarian age. And irregular and regular or irregular cycles in an older woman are are you know they're more likely independent of anything else. We know that the first change as you approach menopause is shortening cycles before they get irregular. For that woman with regular 40-day cycles, I, I would just go by my ovarian reserve testing and I'd say this is what your biologic clock testing shows. And then even if she has regular cycles, I would offer her a clomiphene or letrozole to shorten the cycle length. If nothing else, if you get them every 28 days, she has a chance every 28 days to conceive rather than having to wait every 40 days to conceive. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. The next question is, how do you manage patients asking for ovarian reserve testing who have not tried to get pregnant yet? So um, it's a good question and you can expand it. Years ago, um, I, I was, someone did an article on fertility and I was in it and a private doc was in it. And the patient, the couple they selected had gone to the private doc and they only had six months of trying to get pregnant, young. And he said, come back in six months. And it turned out there was bad male factor and the reporter really blasted the, um, the, the doc. So this is, this, this is the same as any, I'm gonna take liberties and call it an unindicated test. I'm gonna assume that her, so one of the single biggest predictors of the biologic clock of menopause is the maternal, her mom. So if her mom had menopause at 38 and she's 32, I would test her in a heartbeat, even if she's not trying to get pregnant. Um, if you know she has a sister with premature ovarian failure, if her cycles are shorter, but she's not tried yet, I would get that. So, so if there's a risk factor, if there's a concern slam dunk, there's also the group of women who are thinking about freezing their eggs. So this is a new, relatively new thing. The sweet spot, if you had to pick an age, would be 37. If they're before 37, they probably don't need it yet, and there's a decent chance they'll never even use those eggs. But if they're trying to make that decision, 
that's reasonable. So there are niches where it's very reasonable. I don't know that there's any one standard of care. But if we take the single woman who's like, I'm 25, I'm just anxious, you have to treat that the same you would with any patient who wants the ultrasound, who wants any test. And that's very tricky. We have a dual, we have many constituents. We have society that we don't want to spend too much money on unnecessarily. And we have our patient, and we know very well that some of those patients, they're going to go to another doctor, they're going to leave our practice, they're going to tell their friends, and the other doctor will likely order it. And, uh, you know, um, if you want to get out of jail, I'll say, go ahead and test it if you think it's clinically appropriate. Um, but we, we all get those questions all the time. And, and the most important thing I'd like you to take away is think about clinical risk factors. Family, you know, mom went through menopause at age 38. The niche for the woman who's like, I'm thinking of freezing my eggs. Those, I think, are clinically indicated. And then the rest is you use your judgment. You know, and the other thing, she's ordering, you're, she's asking for a single blood test. She's not asking for an MRI of her pelvis. There's a clinical reason for it, and it's not overly expensive. So that's a half answer. Hopefully, it answers enough. Thank you. The next question is, how do you, oh, sorry. What is the maximal age for reasonable poss possible fertility, male and female? The best possible age, Melissa? Uh, it says the maximal age for reasonable. Oh, maximal age. Oh, okay. So we're going to switch to ethics. Um, no correct answer. Um, and, and I hate to use this term, but we kind of play God. And there's lots of different algorithms. Um, and, and, you know, some say, some say we have a responsibility. I think we do have a responsibility to the children. And is it appropriate that when the child hits 10, their parents are in their 60s or 70s? And I've seen algorithms where it's the combined age of the couple that's 100. Um, and as a society, I'm embarrassed. We're biased. You know, we, I have a 60, you know, you see a 60 year old guy with a 30 year old woman and you go, OK, good for him. You see a 60 year old woman with a 30 year old guy and like, oh, that's just creepy. Um, you have to draw the line somewhere um, for the male. We don't have a line in the sand for the woman. We have the appropriate concern of her health during the pregnancy. Um, and, and so we know that when I give my donor egg talk, I say all the risks, going back to what I said earlier, that 30-year-old versus the 40-year-old. So the 30-year-old risk of Downs is one in 1,000, 40 is a one in 100. Risk of miscarriage of a 30-year-old, I don't know, 20%, 15%. 40, it's, it's, it's a 40%, maybe 50%, um, and the chance of getting pregnant is much less. Those all go away with younger egg. The thing that doesn't go away is the risks with pregnancy. And you all know this, the risk of high blood pressure, preeclampsia, the risks and the medical issues. So what do we do? I am not a maternal fetal medicine. I'm not an OB medicine specialist. So we want to get clearance. We want someone to say, this person is a good candidate to get pregnant in their 40s maybe their 50s, um, and, and then it'll be safe. And, oh, we checked, and then we did an EKG if that's appropriate, and that came off with stuff. And we may refer on you, our providers, to say that you feel comfortable. Um, so that's one big thing. But we have to draw the line somewhere. Um, so we say for IVF, don't quote me the numbers, I think it's 44 that we just don't feel comfortable using your own eggs because your chance is next to zero. And although... You know, it's money for us. It's not ethical, and ethics is everything. Um, if you're using a frozen embryo, so for some reason you went through at age 43, and now it's 10 years later and you have a frozen embryo, or more likely it's a donor egg, we say add about 10 years to that. So like around 53, again, the exact number, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, we we won't put back an embryo in you, our, our, in you after age 53, 53rd birthday. Now, uh, we have a fabulous patient care committee where we present where, where the docs advocate for their patients, because ultimately, each of us on this call advocates for our patient. And so I've got this 44-year-old, and her cutoff is less than 44, but she's got you know, low FSH. She went through a cycle before and got 25 eggs, and two were PGT normal. She understands the low chance. Can she get through? And then we do it as a group. We make sure that we are ethically comfortable and patient safety, right? That's more of an ethics than a safety thing. It's more, um, and, and, and ethics, there's, I mean, this is a terrible thing, but do you have the financial, you know, what's going to happen to that 
child if you are if you pass because you're 60 um, and, and that's just a big ethics thing and, and about means and such so the short answer is um, age is everything we have a lower cutoff for own eggs versus high eggs we don't currently have an algorithm that says above a certain age combined we'll take we won't take you um, and it's a case by case and we always advocate for our patients thank you the next question is is decreased ovarian reserve associated with early menopause? Alyssa, I'm sorry, you're gonna to have to speak up. Sure, is is decreased ovarian reserve associated with early menopause? So the one of the big questions is, can we use the ovarian reserve to predict menopause? And the, the challenge is, is there's very little data on sequential testing so where you test a woman every year much less every month and then you see when they go through we know the average age that menopause starts the climactic is 47 we know the average age that people started is 40 is 51.2 and we know it lasts on average about seven years but there's a wide variation and and there's um if you go to websites there's there's um for-profit companies that will say we'll send you a test that will predict uh menopause um but, but ultimately, we can't say specifically uh, when, it, when that you have this value, that means you have this much time off, especially since it's just a snapshot in time, you know, and we know that there's some variability. And even if, you know, someone said, oh, my AMH was 0.48 a year ago, now it's 0.38, how concerned should I be? If I measure it next month, it might be 0.4. So there's so much variability that we can't really do it, but we do know there's a steady, irreversible decline. Thank you. The next question is about how you mentioned E2 can affect FSH levels. What are some causes of elevated E2 besides cancer or checking after day three? So there, there's something called a follicular cyst or residual cyst where you have an estrogen producing follicle. Um, but having said that, if your estrogen is high enough, you probably won't get a period because um, the estrogen just will, will prevent, you'll have a thickened lining. So think of PCOS women, anovulatory women. They don't have regular periods because they don't have the progesterone, but that estrogen just keeps on supporting the lining. So, so if I have a really high E2 that's persistent, it's in our world it's cancer until proven otherwise um there are very boutique things of, of certain types of uh, non-malignant tumors that cause it receptor issues but um a high a high e2 in a typical menstruating woman is impaired ovarian response until proven otherwise a high e2 with um with risk factors for cancer is cancer until proven otherwise all right. The next question is, do you run any of these tests on patients with a leave on a gastral IUD or do you recommend removing it before testing? Yeah. So the question is with an IUD. Um, actually, normally I, I realize I'm not repeating the questions, which I normally do, but the volume of the question for the audience is the same as what I hear. So um, so I typically you could pretty much do the testing with the IUD in place. You could even do a sonar histogram with the IUD in place. Um, the, it, it should not meaningfully impact on your hormones. And in fact, in someone who's freezing eggs or an egg donor or, or freezing embryos, we'll let them go through with the IUD in place. It actually doesn't need to come out. So it's kind of a neat thing. All right, the next question is, is there any variability in AMH levels or ranges between labs, testing methods that generalists should be aware of? I think so. I, I would offer, you know, there's a few tests that are pretty much, the, I mean, a CBC is a CBC is CBC, but on the AMH slide, I, that's the one place where I put in that it depends on the assay. But, you know, we just look at the number, I look at the number, I won't speak for anyone else, and then I move on. But if you know it's from a different lab, then, then what you can do is the labs typically will have their normal values. And if the normal values are close enough and or the values are close enough, you're okay. But we all grew up knowing that the HCG, the beta values, can historically really varied.
based on the assay used because it was the international reference preparation, the international standard. There were these different ways of looking at it, and it would be apples and oranges, completely incomparable. The AMH is not so much, but if you're concerned, go back to the hard copy or the electronic copy of the test itself and look at their normal range. And you could do that essentially with any test. And this is our last question. What is your opinion of at-home ovarian reserve testing kits? Helpful and cost-effective or not helpful given the limited clinical picture? Which kit? Just the at-home ovarian reserve yeah, yeah. test kits. So, you know, I'm embarrassed to say that subspecialists are really uh, skeptical of those types of things. But, I, you know, when people say to you, vitamins is a classic thing. It's, they're just not as regulated. They're not as tested. I've gone on some of the websites. They talk about studies. They don't show the studies. Or you look at the studies, and it's by the person who invented it, and it's their company. Um, and, and you know, it's herbal supplements. I, I, I say with herbal supplements, I'm sure there's some out there that are really helpful, but there's not data for me to know which one is which. So the short answer is, that I do not endorse them. I would much rather have testing in my lab. People bring them in all the time. And you know, like an LH testing kit, that's really accurate. But these kits, they're simply not the data that I would feel comfortable hanging my hat on. The good news is those patients are pretty amenable to repeating it. But I certainly would not, I certainly would not make a decision tree purely based on that. And I would not advocate for them. But as time goes on, you know, as some get more accepted and there's more data, then I might. I actually do have one more question. Please. What about testing progesterone? So um, there's a couple of, of uh, areas to test progesterone. One is just, are they, so I grew up, a progesterone less than 10 was a poor luteal phase, higher than 10 was good ovulation. Um, and, and Pretty much that's gone by the wayside. Um, progesterone, I use in my practice, really have you ovulated, value two, three, either you're ovulated or not. And if someone comes in and they have not a period, I preferentially get a progesterone, not a beta. Because if the beta is negative, they could have a luteal phase pregnancy. Whereas if the progesterone is negative, I know they've not ovulated and therefore they can't be pregnant. If the progesterone is positive, I can then run on that specimen of beta. Um, and if progesterone is negative, then it's, I give them Provera. If it's positive and the HCG is negative, I say, well, you'll get a period. I don't need to get, give you Provera. Um, I used to get progesterones for the quality of ovulation. Um, and I, I've actually done a study on this. Um, and, and we don't do it anymore because it's, it's produced in a, in a cyclical circadian fashion, a pulsatile fashion. And so any one value is not very meaningful. If someone wants it, I joke, well, we can draw your blood every 30 minutes over a day or so and average them, and then it's very accurate. Um, so, so, and then, and then Stovall, if the older people in the crowd remember that years ago, we used to get progesterones for ruling out ectopics. And if it was less than five, it was either an, it was a non-normal pregnancy, either a pending miscarriage or an ectopic. And if it was over 25, we knew it was a healthy, viable IUP, and then the rest was a gray zone. But the real advantage was the less than five, you didn't have to worry about interrupting a viable pregnancy. You could do your DNE, DNC, MVA, or things like that, or give methotrexate. But we subsequently realized that progesterones are all over the place, and women with low progesterones can have normal, healthy pregnancies. So progesterones had a lot of promise in my era. I personally, clinically, pretty much only use it as have you ovulated, I don't get it on a routine workup if someone has regular cycles. Importantly, if someone has irregular cycles, I still don't get it. If it's positive, okay, I caught you when you ovulated, but I know you're ovulating because you get your periods every three to six weeks, not every three to six years. And if it's negative, okay, I caught you when you didn't ovulate. Either way, I'm going to look for causes, and either way, I'm going to treat you with clomiphene or Thank you. That was our last question. Thank you, Dr. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar on ovarian reserve assessment. If you have any other questions, you can contact myself, Alyssa Cooper at ecooper at bostonivf.com. 
Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate it if you could complete the survey and provide your feedback to help us with future educational webinars. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Boston IVF and Dr. Frischman, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Frischman. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, everyone.